For decades, they came happily. On this day, they come almost reluctantly. They're saying goodbye. They still browse, but at an informal museum. They don't bring flowers to pay respects. They return with the things they bought here, employee awards they earned here. They have come to share memories. My husband and I, who is since deceased, we bought this for my daughter, who has since deceased, for her 10th birthday. This is a nice gesture that Lazarus used to do for their employees, was people would write in and uh, tell something good about the, the clerk that waited on them. And it was, you were very fortunate if you, if you got an apple, because uh, they weren't just handed out left and right. They were very scrutinized on the giving. Okay, well every year we always made a practice of bringing our kids up to see Santa Claus. I have five daughters, but at the time we just had the three. And so we brought them up and uh, we see Santa Claus and then we go out to eat afterwards. It's kind of a reward for them for being good. And we did that for years. And the oldest picture here, the girl's seven years old, the oldest one. And now she is 47. Since 1851, people from Columbus have been coming downtown to shop at Lazarus. You could get anything from cosmetics to a garden tractor. You could get it yourself and make a day of it, or you could have it delivered. We celebrated holidays here. Your first trip on your own may have been on a city bus to Lazarus. Thousands of us worked here. A lot of us met someone here we'd fall in love with and marry. Downtown Lazarus was everything to Columbus. Now, it's history. Many Happy Returns to Lazarus is made possible in part by the Columbus Foundation, assisting donors and others in strengthening and improving the community for the benefit of all its citizens. The Ohio Historical Society, a nonprofit organization that serves as the state's partner in preserving and interpreting Ohio's history, archaeology, and natural history. Information at www.ohiohistory.org. And with the help of the many people of Columbus and Central Ohio who shared their Lazarus memories and mementos. When Johnny came marching home at the end of the Civil War, one of the first things he wanted was to get out of his uniform. That gave a Columbus merchant named Simon Lazarus an idea that was just ahead of its time. He had a little tailor shop across the street. At that time, there were 200 tailor shops up and down High Street. He got in a horse and buggy, because there were no automobiles then, went up to Rochester, New York, and came back with 200 ready-made suits. 10 or 20 years later, there were about 10 tailors up and down High Street. Simon Lazarus was a rabbinical scholar who happened to be a clothing merchant. In 1851, he came from his native Prussia to join a stepbrother in Columbus, a town of 18,000 with plank sidewalks and unpaved streets. He took a 20 by 40 room in a building at Town and High and opened for business. Simon's sons, Fred and Ralph, practiced customer relations with Morgan's Raiders, Confederate prisoners who were allowed run of the city. Evidently, they came in and, um, and took some, some clothing, and uh, uh, Fred and Ralph uh, went out there and, and got it back, which took a lot of guts, I would think, and may, may, maybe wasn't too smart. One room became two, and Simon's innovative one-price approach to selling merchandise attracted customers. The story I've heard is that, that uh, every, the, the price was marked on, on all the merchandise and that, uh, and that uh, it's got away from what had been the practice of, uh, of bargaining with a, with a customer and obviously uh, most customers felt, uh, felt more comfortable uh, uh, doing that. Interestingly, in those days, there was no water available. So Fred and Ralph, 
used to have to go down to the river with buckets to get water for the store. That wasn't an easy task. They were brought up behind the counter, the same as all the rest of us were. In 1877, Columbus lost not only the founder of what would be its signature store, but its first ordained rabbi. It was said of Simon Lazarus that he had caused many a heart and soul to soar aloft on the wings of devotion to their God. Fred and Ralph changed the name of the store to F and R Lazarus when their father died. They did the advertising, bookkeeping, buying, and some of the selling. By 1881, they had 22 employees. By 1887, you could visit Lazarus and get women's and children's shoes and a Three Brothers cigar. That's a Three Brothers cigar. It's a cigar that they used to give out to everybody who bought men's suits. And Uncle Ralph uh, used to stand at the door of the old store across the street. He'd go into the men's department, and as people left, he'd be at the door again, handing him out a Three Brothers cigar. In the 1890s, the store's weather whistle gave the city a forecast. An employee was designated to calm the horses outside when it blew. Birds in giant cages created an exotic atmosphere in the store. Storerooms were added, united by a new front. The building became known as the Clock Tower Store because of the remarkable feature that crowned it. And at night, its 800 lights lit up the sky. By day, one of Columbus's most popular attractions was the Lazarus Power Plant. You took a tunnel under Town Street to get there. Fred and Ralph installed a Niagara soda fountain, offering mostly floats and sarsaparilla. If you asked for it gassed, it meant you'd get your concoction with birch oil and carbonation. Lazarus was in the food business. The store grew to 100,000 square feet and had 150 employees. Soon, the next generation of Lazarus men proposed a bold move. My father and my uncle persuaded my grandfather to put all of the family's assets behind that move. And they built a five-story building in a basement over there. It was a risky move. Because of a national depression, it was the only big store built in the country that year. Would there ever be a need for a store this size? Top two floors were empty. The basement was the basement level, and at the bottom of the basement level was a live alligator. The excitement began at around 11 p.m. on a Saturday. A platform was laid from curb to curb on Town Street, and everything was put in trucks and moved from the old store. When the new store opened Monday, Lazarus boasted, we've never been closed one minute for construction or repairs. Sales nearly doubled the first year in the new store. It was a wonder and featured the latest conveniences, including an escalator. Unfortunately, that's when the first escalator was put in in this part of the country as well. And it evidently scared the daylights out of people. I wasn't around in those days, but they had to take it out a year later. The store would grow, and there would be changes, additions, and refinements. Lazarus, for instance, revolutionized retailing in the 1930s when it began arranging merchandise by size instead of brand. But this is the store, at town and high, that generations still remember. For hundreds of thousands of people, Lazarus became a landmark. Lazarus wasn't a store to shop at downtown. Lazarus was the store, the only store we shopped at. Now when I came down, I made a point of putting my hat on, and I also brought my gloves, because I never went to Lazarus without hat and gloves. And if I were feeling better, I would have gotten my high heels on today. I would have put on my nice fancy dress, because I'm telling you, I did this as late as 1967. That's how recently we ladies used to dress up to go shopping at Lazarus. It wasn't just a shopping adventure. It was an experience that you were going to experience a lot of things when you did come to the department store other than shopping. 
I remember the associates that used to be here, how wonderful it was to shop here. You could find anything you wanted. Oh, I love the atmosphere. I love the people that waited on us. I uh, love the cosmetics. One of my favorite things was the information um, box that you had, because my father always let me press the button, and I always asked, where's the toy department? So that was always fun for me. Because I grew up in the South End, my friends and I would walk from St. Mary's High School so we could go into the Colonial Room and eat their wonderful dressing and get a Pepsi, and it would cost us 37 cents. When, when Lazarus had a July sale, you better be prepared. The, the islands would be mobbed with people snatching and grabbing and trying to get the, the bargain ahead of the neighbor standing over there. They, they really, it was just a mob scene, they, but it was lots of fun. We loved going to uh, the uh, music section, uh, uh, the uh, I think they had instruments back then. Uh, we, we came to look at the instruments, and um, it was just uh, a bit, it was the main, main thing in downtown to us kids. At the time, the perception was is the downtown store had everything. And, uh, and I think a lot of people were very loyal to the downtown store. They did all of their shopping there, all of their, their, their uh, clothing, their appliances, their furniture, their televisions, you know, everything, that, everything could be purchased at the downtown store. But Lazarus was always here. It was faithful. It was like the landmark of Columbus. If you told people, I'll meet you at Lazarus, they knew right where it was. You know, there was no mistake in that nobody had to ask, where is it at? Everybody knew, and it, it was just like an icon of Columbus. The modern building that opened in 1909 at the northwest corner of Town and High was more than a landmark for shoppers. Thousands of people worked here, too, in all kinds of jobs, but they were never called workers or employees. Dad was the guy who first, as far as I know, invented the name Associates. From the, from the start, or as long, as long as I can remember, uh, our, the, the workers were associates, and they really were associates. They were part of the part of the team. Associates means they're all on a level. They're not employees. They're the same as management or anybody else. I was an associate the same as anybody else was. My mother started here in the early 40s. Uh, she retired in the early 70s and spent her entire life in one department, Front Street Level Shoes. My sister and I both joined her for not that many years, though. And, uh, between the three of us, we had over 70 years in shoe business. So Lazarus is a very big part of our lives. Brought in a uh, pack, small package delivery uniform, uh, which they started uh, delivering in 1942, I believe. World War II had started, and the men had left. Uh, and there was hardly any of the fellows left anymore. And they posted a notice on the board, and. Uh, we, a uh, couple of girls, uh, decided to try it out. And I made it, and my friend didn't. After college, my first job was um, in what was in the annex, and uh, it was uh, selling tulip bulbs and crocuses and hyacinths. It was in the fall, uh, which is the time to sell those. And I was quite an expert on, uh, on them, but I wasn't quite sure when you planted them, if you planted them this way or that way. So I'm afraid that I may have sold a lot of uh, tulip bulbs and they ended up growing down instead of growing up. But I work in better lingerie and uh, worked there many years, summers and Christmas when I was home from college. And that's how I supported myself during the summers and Christmas. I started out as an extra and I, I worked in every department at Lazarus except for appliances and men's clothing. I sold everything and eventually the pharmacy got me and I stayed there for a year and then I was the Easter Bunny in 1960 and in 62 I was a Santa Bell. I just kind of walked around the store, had a basket of candy and got to greet all the little kids. I didn't have any place to sit but it was a hot, very hot costume for being 17 years old and I thought it was a real treat. I decided to go into retail merchandising at Ohio State and we had a mentorship where we had to do uh, one quarter 
in a store, and I was here at Lazarus, and was going to be, my uh, goal was to be a retail merchandising buyer in the store. And I did that, went back to school, graduated, and then did come back and work. And I worked at Lazarus about 14 years. It was my first job out of college, so I was very excited. I graduated from college on a Saturday and started at Lazarus on Monday morning. My first job was here at Lazarus. In 1961, when I graduated from high school, I worked in the credit department. Back then, if you can imagine, we paid the employees in cash. And so they would lock us in a small room, um, all six or eight of us, and uh, we had stacks of cash in front of us, and we, we would get the pay envelopes, just a little brown envelope, and it would tell all the breakdown and how much money we were supposed to put in there. And can you imagine paying employees that way today? <laughs> it's just uh, unbelievable. That was a an operative, as they say, plain clothes operative. So uh, I got to walk the floor in my street clothes and uh, the main objective was to prevent theft, catch shoplifters. And I think the worst job was in the drapery hardware department. We were there for inventory and if you can imagine counting all those, all those things that you use in a drapery workroom. Well, anyway. I started in actually 58 because uh, I went to Central High School right across the river and I was in distributive education my uh, senior year and I'd go to school half a day and came over here and worked half a day. And I worked stock, ran freight elevator, did all things behind the scene uh, when I first started. They told me people stayed forever at Lazarus and I didn't believe them. 42 years later, I wonder if they weren't telling the truth. You could get practically anything at Lazarus. People drove, took the bus, streetcar, or train to get to the store. What kept them coming back, though, was the store's basic but revolutionary philosophy. Well, this started Lord knows when, probably with my great-grandfather. If you don't like it for some reason, bring it back. We'll gladly take it back. And we'd take anything back. And I do mean anything. And some people brought back stuff repeatedly. I can say it now. They bought bridal dresses, silverware, plateware, expensive things, had their party, and then returned the merchandise. One of the other buyers had made a protest because the people in their department had taken back some things that really he didn't think should have taken back and they were quite old. And that day, Mr. Charles Lazarus uh, met up with that person and said, come here, I want to show you something. And they went out to the front of the building and looked up and he said, what does the sign up there say? And then the buyer said, it says Lazarus. And Mr. Charles said, when your name is on the front of the building, you can make the decisions about what our return policy is. One day, Robert Lazarus and I were walking uh, on the uh, second floor, I believe it was, and he looked over and he saw a salesperson and a lady obviously arguing with each other. And he didn't run that kind of a store, so he marched over there. And he said to the sales girl, he says, what, what, what's this about? She says, Mr. Lazarus, she wants to return this shirt. And Mr. Lazarus says, well, give her her money back. Make it good. She says, but Mr. Lazarus, you don't understand. It says J.C. Penny on the label here. He says, give her her money back, and she did. Occasionally, you might get taken advantage of, but very occasionally. And uh, the, 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 good, uh, the, the good vibrations you got from that policy way, way outnumbered uh, uh, any, any time that you were taken advantage of. There, there are lots of stories. Lazarus didn't rely solely on its return policy to keep people coming back. The management wanted to make shopping at the store a memorable experience. And the live alligator was symptomatic, this was in 1909, of bringing people into the store, creating the kind of excitement that would make people come in. So when you shopped at Lazarus, you could find everything imaginable. 
You could return it if you didn't like it. And you could expect something special would happen during your visit. Then when I got to be a teenager, they brought the two, usually it was one of the two top bands at the time, for teenagers anyway, uh, Fifth Order and Dante's would come down and play, and you'd come down, watch them on a Saturday. With my quiet kind of girl, yes, she's fine. Oh, the special events was, it was a circus. It was really a circus. You always had something going on. You had the Italian fair, the British fair. Uh, you had uh, celebrities come in. Ed Sullivan came a couple of times, and he brought Jay Fred Muggs one time. I remember they put him in my arms, and that monkey wrapped his arms around my neck and my waist. And I, I said, take him off. I couldn't stand it. But he was a very loving monkey. We had Gloria Swanson a couple of times. And, uh, oh, Cesar Romero, do those names mean something to you? Polly Bergen, wore the biggest diamond ring I've ever seen. Ann Miller, who just died, uh, she wanted a spaghetti dinner well after midnight. We had flower shows that brought in thousands of women. And we had a cat show once that uh, was very, very popular, but the entire store, through the ventilation system, got a little smelly. So they tried to perfume the place, and that made it even worse. And I remember that they decided no more cat shows. <laughs> so uh, there was excitement constantly, and we had modeling in the main dining room every day. When we first started out, you would have to go through classes, and I was probably maybe three to five years old. And they'd walk you through classes and do etiquettes and then you'd model every season's change you know for back to school christmas clothing whatever come up you were called to model and uh, they put on a style show six floor six floors nothing but for children's back then our daughter was 16 months old and they had a moms and children show it was probably this time of year and um, most of the children um, either balked about going out or they'd cry once they got out on the stage so I wasn't sure how she was going to respond, but um, when she walked out with me, she looked everybody in the eye and said, hi! <laughs> so that was kind of exciting for me and my mother. And I remember one model, Alice McKenzie, who was kind of like a gazelle anyway, and she was beautiful. She got a head start on that runway and she leaped off the end of it. She couldn't stop herself and jumped over one of those things that holds the dishes. <laughs> jumped right over it onto the floor, got a big hand. She got right up and started walking, went right out. Never hurt her a bit. Springtime was a wonderful time at Lazarus. And every spring before Easter, the whole first floor, all of the columns, were lined with bird cages, with birds in them who sang like crazy. And people would come downtown just to see and hear the birds. And it just might happen that they'd buy something while they were there. Just might happen. We had a bird boy who uh, took care of the, the birds. And I believe I mentioned once before that he put a drop of whiskey in, in the bird bath. I mean, the uh, little drinking uh, cup for the birds because there was such a draft especially on the first floor. And the birds would get croup, and in the morning you'd come there and the birds would be like this. So that helped them. But they were covered each night. Of course, they scratched seed all over the place, and it was a big job keeping up with it, but that was excitement. Everything from uh, baby animal farms to the 80-year-old teas to uh, teen modeling clinics to uh, everybody was, was, was trying to make it a special experience. Why did we do it? It's show business. That's all merchandising is. Right from the goods, right from the, uh, from the article. In fact, the store got into show business when it produced Look to Lazarus, one of the first television shows in Columbus, a predecessor of home shopping shows. It was a, basically a half hour commercial show and then Bill Pepper, some people may remember him. He and I would act as a husband and wife team in selling household items. Since it was a live show, 
some interesting things would always happen. One time when I was um, supposed to be selling a shower head, uh, I was behind the shower curtain, of course in a bathing suit, and I was just supposed to stick out my head and then give the pitch for the uh, shower head. Well, the uh, guys behind the scene decided to pull a trick on me. They were always full of it. And they turned the cold water on me and uh, my reaction was starting to laugh because I wasn't expecting this cold water. Of course, the audience wasn't in on the joke, so uh, poor Pat had to come in and uh, kind of take over for me <laughs> and get me out of that pinch. Lazarus became more than a place to buy bathroom accessories or a dinette set. This landmark store became a place where rites of passages were observed. For thousands of young Columbus women, that meant learning about grooming, poise, and the impropriety of wearing white shoes with a dark dress. These self-improvement classes were only one of the milestone events people still associate with the store. My oldest boy, John Richard, um, brought him down to have his first haircut, and that was in 1967, and they gave, uh, they gave us a graduation certificate with a lock of his hair saying that he graduated from ha babyhood. And then the neat thing was, I had another child in 71, Jason, and the same lady that cut my son's hair in, in 67 is the one that cut my second child's son. Uh, so that was, that was really neat to have the same lady do it. And then one of my favorite memories of all time was when I turned 13, my mom said that I could have my first outing alone. So I could take the bus downtown to Lazarus all by myself and I could eat lunch in the colonial room and have the, the famous celery dressing and then take the bus back home. So that was my, that's one of my favorite memories. I was working in the display department and she was working downtown as a secretary for one of the buyers and the job opened up in the display department and she took that job and that's where I met my wife. And uh, we've been married now for 27 years. So. Uh, like a lot of people, I'm sure, have met their spouses there. I had my uh, wedding bridal shower luncheon, was here for my, my bridesmaids. That was when the chintz room, I don't know if they call it the chintz room, but it was on the south side of the store, not in the location that has been for many years. But just any, any celebration, Lazarus was the place to do it. My, um... Now, husband was a assistant buyer in the basement shoe department, and I met him. We dated and were married, uh, so we met at Lazarus and fell in love. Shopping, fashion shows, live bands, celebrities. You could work up a real appetite at Lazarus. The restaurants at the store made the day downtown all that more special. Well, they were our pride and joy. Um, we had nine of them in this store over here. The main thing was that you had so many choices because there were so many restaurants on different floors. And we used to use the restaurants initially to pull people through the merchandise so that the restaurants when we first built them were in the farthest location we could find. I would walk to Lazarus I would have lunch every day at last, not every day, but at the fountain, and I would have celery dressing and an orange drink, and it was 50 cents. And to me, that was just the ultimate. And we could come into a restaurant, and uh, for 25 cents, we had this stuffing with gravy, and for a dime, you got something to drink. And probably, I didn't even know about tipping, so I just put my 35 cents on the table, you know, and that was that. As a, as a child, I would, I would make money all summer, babysitting and such, and before school, before school started, even at nine or 10, I would ride the bus downtown by myself, go into Lazarus, shop and spend the money that I had, that I had made and earned all summer and then decide whether I should go to the dining room for a hidden sandwich or to the west basement for a hot dog. I just always remember coming down here eating at the, the Highlander Grill, which was in the basement and the chintz room and the colonial room, and it was, it was always fun to 
have the, the special things that you couldn't get any, anywhere else, you know, like their dressing and uh, um, their uh, ice cream uh, balls that they would roll in nuts and, and cake and stuff like that was always fun. My father worked here for many years in the restaurant department and so I pretty feel like I pretty much grew up here and um, my mom just died recently and she would have been the first person here so I kind of do this in memory of her. So we kind of felt real important coming to Lazarus like our dad was working here and she would um, bring all six kids of us up here and we'd get all dressed up with the white gloves and everything and come up here and eat lunch with my dad in the colonial room. People associated with coming downtown as with eating, which is all, always a good experience, and so that, that was a happy time, too. In 1951, Lazarus celebrated its 100th anniversary with a gala celebration that became one of the most memorable events in the store's history. Associates took to the stage for the Centennial Showcase. Thousands flocked to the store for a special sale. Ed Sullivan was the star of a really big show, a men's style show and a special window display packed the streets. The whole uh, front of the store had dioramas of significant things that had happened in Columbus and this community. And they were miniatures of scenes. Uh, they were uh, very, very costly and they were beautifully framed and they were big. The store uh, donated, I believe, and uh, at that time, uh, a building for the United Community Council is uh, uh, to, to uh, celebrate that event. Uh, but there were all kinds of, uh, of special events. The Centennial was a significant milestone for a store that was recognized as a national leader. But there's another special event that caused even more excitement and drew even larger crowds. It happened every year. Well, Christmas at Lazarus was really probably the best example of store excitement because it was not only in the windows all through the store, we had this huge tree up on top of the store, tree of lights on top of the elbow. We had waterfalls on the front of the store, which you could see from all over town. So it started on the outside. Then when you went in the building, everything you looked at. Oh man, Christmas at Lazarus was a, a true celebration. We, we would go to the secret gift shop and shop for our parents and our our uh, sisters and brothers and and go see Santa Claus. Uh, it was a big deal, a real big deal for us. It was it was uh, the most exciting part of the year for us to come to Lazarus for Christmas. Lazarus played an instrumental role in the way the nation celebrates the holidays, but even Fred Lazarus Jr. couldn't pull it off alone. Russell, this is going to be a grand Thanksgiving party, and we're going to have a very big turkey, and there's going to be very little left of him when we get through. He got to know Roosevelt a little bit. Don't ask me how. My Uncle Fred um, thought that it would be helpful if uh, Thanksgiving were moved to the, from the last Thursday of the month, which it had been, to the fourth Thursday of the month. and then, So in certain years, that would provide for extra shopping days between Thanksgiving, which was the traditional start of the Christmas shopping, and Christmas. He was so secretive about this, that even his two partners, Simon and Robert, knew nothing about it. They always met each day up in one of their offices first thing. The next morning, they started the meeting and my dad said to Uncle Fred, what damn fool did this? Had this changed? And Uncle Fred said, you're looking at him. And this is how Dad and Uncle Bob found out about the change in Thanksgiving. I think that Simon was uh, concerned it might interfere with uh, the Michigan game, which was the, the main thing on, on his agenda. He was a, a great Ohio State football fan. One thing that was always very clear is, is we had no Christmas decorations or anything visible right up to Thanksgiving. And when the store closed on that Wednesday night before uh, at 9 o'clock, uh, all the trucks were lined up ready to bring in all the Christmas decorations. And so 
Um, we worked all night long. We uh, put up the Christmas trees and the garland and, and you know decorations throughout the entire store. And uh, of course, the the store was closed on Thanksgiving Day, but that that following Friday. Uh, it was like a, a magical transformation. The, you had just a, the store one day, and then this, you know, Christmas, you know, holiday wonderland the next. And I used to get a big kick at Christmas time on our glee club, which was another one of our associate activities. Used to stand on the steps by the front door, and when the doors opened, they'd sing, "Oh, come, all ye faithful." And it, it was a tradition. It always happened, and people came in just to take a look at them. At Christmas, you came down to see the Lazarus Corner, or you just missed, you missed the Christmas celebration. There were crowds that went all the way around the, almost around the block. Uh, I can remember uh, uh, them lining up on High Street uh, on, on Thanksgiving Day to see the window, and uh, it, it was quite, a, quite a, an event. When I was about four, five, six, we were just about eye level with all those wonderful characters that are skating on the ice, the little animals, the squirrels, the bears, and it was magic. It was just like, you did not walk through it, you were in it, it was your little world, and we would just dream about going there every, every Christmas. Sometimes the, the mechanical things were just incredible, and quite ahead of their time, I think. It was just all lit up and very exciting and very electric. Uh, I remember the, season began with the Thanksgiving parade and, and having been recently hired by Lazarus I had the wherewithal to be out on the roof. Uh, we climbed out a window and watched the parade over the Thanksgiving Day Parade and of course that's when Santa arrived. So it was a lot of fun. I was in charge of all the bands, organizing all the bands for the floats and uh, we were getting ready here at the store to load up everybody to go to the parade. Spook Beckman was supposed to be our Santa Claus and he had not shown up and um, we tried to reach him by telephone but uh, he was unlisted. So the vice president of the store called the, the uh, telephone operator here in Columbus and tried to get in touch with him. We sent a Columbus police cruiser to his house, picked him up, brought him back to the store, got him dressed and he was in the parade. I can remember coming to see Santa and it was just a wonderful experience. It was just gorgeous the way they had everything decorated and they would have the elves there, and he was the best Santa that you ever seen in your entire life that they had here. And the line would go up on the sixth floor, and the line at Santa Land would go through the kids' clothes, all the way through the pet storage, so you all would see the bird. And then um, you'd have these lines of Santa Clauses, and you know, the real Santa was always a Lazarus. The toy department was really something then. That it expanded from about eight or 10 salespeople, which was normal during the year, to. 130 or 140 salespeople at, uh, at Christmas time. And a lot of people don't remember, but at one time Lazarus had little animals up on the sixth floor and they had Mr. Tree. So on your way to see Santa, you'd stop and see Mr. Tree and he would talk to you. It was a talking tree and I think they donated it to Children's Hospital. Did Adam see Santa Claus? Yeah. yeah. Did you sit on Santa's lap? Yeah. Mr. Tree tried to sit on Santa's lap, but Mr. Tree couldn't. Mr. Tree's too big for Santa's lap, isn't he? Uh, I'm wearing a picture of me at five years old, came down to see the real Santa Claus at Lazarus. One of my fondest childhood memories is going to Lazarus um, at Christmas time as a child and uh, getting to see Santa and the magic windows and the toy land and the train sets. and It was just, just a great, great experience. And then 40 some years later, I get an opportunity to actually work as Santa at Lazarus and that experience being on the other side of it was just, uh, just something that was just, just hard to explain and I'll never forget it. I don't think in all the years that I ever went to Lazarus to see Santa that I knew that there was more than one Santa Claus and as a Santa belt, can we tell this now? Can we do this now? We had I think six Santas and every Santa had their own Santa bells and there was like six little lanes that went to different Santas and it, that, I loved that job. I was an elf at Santa Land. See, I brought the picture even. So you back when I was a little more mobile. Yeah, yeah, it was cool. The kids were just, oh, the kids were just like, 
and then they'd start shaking because they were so excited, you know, and, and yeah, and your job is to make sure that they would talk or do something, you know. I remember um, several times standing in line and being so excited to see Santa Claus, um, but then when it came that time, oftentimes I would re retreat back to my parents and was too afraid to sit on his lap. Well, doing the, the, the Santa and the ho, ho, ho was something that uh, we really didn't do a whole lot of because a lot of the children were timid and a little shy coming up to see Santa. But if, if you had um, kids that were really warming up to you, you could give them the old ho, 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 and they really, they really kind of liked that. And so it was, it was all part of the, being Santa. So the first memory I had was Secret Santa gift shop. My mom would take uh, myself and my twin sister shopping in the Secret Santa gift shop and go see Santa Claus. You know, your parents would give you money and you'd go in to do the Secret Santa shopping for all of your family and stuff like that and for your brothers and sisters and your your parents and it was nice to have a surprise and they would wrap and box everything up for you and you'd take it home. For Christmas this year I went ahead and made a book because of all the special memories um, of all of our trips down to Lazarus at Christmas with Santa. And I went year to year, starting with my oldest daughter, and then followed through with every, I have two sons that came after her. And I just made uh, little stories on some of them. And then some years we even brought their friends down just to share with, with all the magic that we had here at Christmas at Lazarus. Oh, it was a fairyland. It was just a fairyland. We couldn't wait for the opening of the town and high street front windows. We couldn't wait to see the uh, toy land. We couldn't wait to see the real Santa Claus and his elves and everything. Now, in recent years, they had things for the children, the talking tree and things like that. We didn't have that. We just knew, though, that we were in the presence of the real Santa Claus at downtown only Lazarus. In 1912, Lazarus had its first million dollar year. In 1962, it had its first million dollar day. With its huge selection, generous return policy, popular restaurants and special events, the store attracted loyal customers. It seemed like Lazarus would do anything to make customers happy. Even a child's request to Charles Lazarus could get results. Child asked, uh, since we carry a lot of different hats, do we have magic hats that a rabbit can come out of? So it was handed to me, and what can we do here? And I basically took a jack-in-the-box uh, and installed it inside of a top hat that I believe we got from the bridal department uh, at that time. Uh, all things that were sold within the store, and we assembled this so you'd crank the uh, little crank on the side of the uh, hat, and the rabbit would pop up out of the hat. So that was sort of one of the little things we did, but that was just in keeping with, let's keep that customer satisfied. And uh, since we had the tools and the knowledge in the display department to do some unusual things, that's sort of how we got involved in that. And uh, it, was, it was great to do though, because you, you knew you were making somebody happy. Lazarus did anything it could think of to build loyal customers. Loyal workers were important too. Well, the loyalty was because they you felt you were part of the, of the family because of the benefits they got. There just isn't any, there just isn't another company today that care for people, you know. I sold for 33 years and became a commission salesman, made a very good living, made a lot of friends, and uh, I'm just internally, you know, grateful for that opportunity that I had back then. The parties and the dances at the Southern Hotel, they had, oh, they had the best employee dinners and parties. This is a delivery uh, bowling shirt. Uh, the store had uh, great activities such as golf, <clears throat> um, baseball, and so forth. And this was my bowling shirt in uh, 42. We had not only the 20 year club, we had a bridge club, we had all kinds of clubs. We had basketball leagues, baseball leagues. We had everything. We had golf outings, and we did anything and everything to keep the employees happy, associates happy, excuse me, and all of us happy. 
It's the most wonderful store to work for. I mean, I've had numerous jobs in there. Even when I was drafted during the Korean War, I was stationed as part of it in California. The, I used to get their lasers and fuses and at Christmas time, I would get the most wonderful packages and people just marveled working for a store like that, that they would take the time to send it to me. Even takes me back to my first few years in the early 70s when Mr. Robert would come in the side door. He was probably in his 80s at the time, but come through the store and I was so impressed by the relationship he would walk through, not just to speak to executives, but to speak to salespeople on the floor all by name. And that was the family part of the memories. And again, how Mr. Charles and, and Mr. Robert and Mr. Simon knew everybody's name and knew about their families and care about them and ask questions about them. They were doing management by wandering around before that was a, before that was a buzz phrase in the business world. I was like 21 and I had to have my tonsils taken out and I was going to take my vacation. And they said, no, you're not taking a vacation. You go ahead and take time out and get your tonsils out. And I did and they paid me my salary and I hadn't been here just a year. So that was very nice, you know. And they did so many wonderful things for us, I can't tell you, you know, it was just a pleasure to work here. So I think it probably gave opportunity to women, uh, I would say almost as much as men. I have to say, of course, that it's still a problem with women being recognized as much as men, but that was, that was a place where they could shine and did. Being a Lazarus buyer, gave you probably one of the best foundations of training for retail anywhere in the country. And people respected you so much in the business that you could go with Lazarus on your resume and go really any place in the country to another department store or to some other type of retail, whether it was a large company or a small company. And you were pretty much assured, at least an entree, but practically your next job anyway. The Lazarus training was second to none in retail. We had an associate's cafeteria. We have a discount, which I still get as long as I live, I have that discount. We had a great associate's cafeteria where the food was very cheap. You could get a tray full of food for a dollar. A department store like that is kind of like a, a city in itself. Uh, we, uh, we worked there at night and we, we were fed magnificently. We had a marvelous cafeteria. Uh, I had my breakfast there for over 30 years. <laughs> it was terrible eating alone after I left there. The store used to be open from 12 to 9 on Monday, and they would give the employees, everybody that worked came in at 12 o'clock. And then they have a dinner hour, which is always free in the cafeteria. They gave you, they, you got a free meal every Monday. That was part of, part of the benefit, yeah. I can tell you that it was a marvelous experience and uh, I made friendships there that were friendships for life and I was proud to work for the store that I came to love and respect and, and I, I grew, no question about it. I, uh, I was given a chance to grow and uh, it, was like a, it was like a flowering in one's life and I wasn't alone in that. Through the years, Lazarus championed the city's growth, knowing it would be good for business. Lazarus may have been perfectly suited for its day, but by the 60s, its days were numbered. Don't forget, there were no highways when department stores were strong, none. There were streets, there was public transportation, and that's the way people got there. When Columbus began growing away from downtown, when highways and interstates fostered growth in the suburbs, Lazarus had to follow. Westland, the first branch store, opened in 1962. People started to prefer to shop closer to home, uh, e easier to park, uh, more casual. Uh, it was a sign of the times. As customers change, Stores are going to change. You've seen that right here in Columbus. Uh, we went through the downtown era. We went through, or have partially gone through, the big shopping center era. 
We went through the strip center era. What era are we in now? It's our job to provide the customers the merchandise where they want it, when they want it, and how they want it. And uh, they say they want it in branches for the, prime, for, for the most part these days. But change is change, and we got to take it into account and, and do the best we can to plan for it and make it what people want. And so, in August of 2004, Columbus experienced the end of an era. Time had finally gotten the best of an institution that had been a huge part of life in central Ohio. After 153 years, there would be no downtown Lazarus. In its heyday, you could get anything at this store. Now, it can provide nothing but memories. We all came down and needed the chintz room all the time. Uh, toys, you know, it's just sickening to know that the place is going to close. Oh, it just went through my whole life. And when my daughter was going to proms and such, I remember shopping here looking for things for her. And I still have some furniture that my parents bought here. My dad bought a leather top coffee table, a leather top end table, a leather top desk that he wanted the very best and he got those and they're in my house today. So I've just had a wonderful life with Lazarus and I'm really going to miss it. Everybody I know has some memory about Lazarus and especially there's something about the one downtown being the original Lazarus store. I mean that's where everybody went. You know that was the, the only place and the best place to go and it was just um, I just have those happy memories. I'll never forget that, my mom bringing me here. And I hope my daughter will remember when I brought her here also. The philosophy of this family molded the values of a community. And I don't think you can put enough uh, uh, value on that. So uh, they really were an amazing force here in Central Ohio that taught to all of us a really good way to run a business and a really good way to treat your people and a really good way to treat your customers. I learned to be a good cashier and a really good person in how to treat people at Lazarus. I really did. I mean, they taught me well. And I'm 44 years later, I'm still doing it. Uncle Fred loved to say that 50 years from now, if the world was destroyed, an excavation started and they ran into a department store, they could get a very, very good picture of the way civilization was. 50 years before, by the merchandise that was carried, by the excitement that showed up in the store, and by the people who came to shop. People should remember their own personal uh, experiences, and uh, and that, that that's and that's fun. I mean, to to remember what the store meant to them uh, and to their their children and grandchildren and so forth. Uh, it, uh, I, I hope that they have, you know, same kind of pleasant memories of it that I do. Uh, uh, that, uh, but it's a different time and a, and a different era, and uh, uh, and you, you can be you can be a little sad that it's that it's that it's gone, but uh, there, re there really is nothing that uh, that, sh that you can do except have. Uh, uh, memories of, uh, of those better days, when better days for, for that store anyway. Many happy returns to Lazarus is made possible in part by the Columbus Foundation, assisting donors and others in strengthening and improving the community for the benefit of all its citizens. The Ohio Historical Society, a nonprofit organization that serves as the state's partner in preserving and interpreting Ohio's history, archaeology, and natural history.
Information at www.ohiohistory.org.